welcome to the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy Podcast. I'm here to talk about getting rid of burnout, increasing job satisfaction, and feeling like an expert in what you do. One thing that created a lot of burnout and angst for me was trying to get continued medical education right at the last minute. So why not join the CME membership and do CME while listening to this podcast? Go to psychiatrypodcast.com, sign up, sign in, take the test, and the certification is emailed to you in seconds. All right, welcome back to the podcast. I am joined today with three medical students, Madison O'Rourke, Kyle Logan, Matthew Hagley. Today we are going to be doing openness. It's one of the big five personality types. And I thought we would start with defining openness, the different domains of openness, according to the gold standard, the Neo PI3, and talk about our own scores in it and kind of what it means. And then we'll get into some psychopathology. We're going to be talking about ecstasy, ketamine, you know, do the psychedelics increase openness? We'll talk about schizophrenia and openness, some interesting findings there, and how to think about what you might do if someone was super low or super high openness in terms of therapy, how you can think about this domain. So it's something that I think is useful. I've used it in marriage therapy. Once in a while, have a, a couple where you have a very high openness and a low openness individual together and helping them navigate their marriage with those differences and, you know, decreasing the shame maybe of having those differences, but just like, how do we work together? How do we communicate? So I'm excited to have you guys on. Yeah. Excited to be here. (laughs) Now, um, Maddie's taking the lead on this one. She did most of the digging. So maybe we'll start with the domains. And then after we talk about each domain, we'll talk about how we scored in it and what that might mean. I think this might help this be a little bit more concrete, like what openness is. Yeah. So let's start with fantasy. Uh, Maddie, tell me what high and low fantasy would be in someone. Yeah. So for fantasy, if you're high in fantasy, you have a very active imagination and fantasy life. So you would enjoy things like entertaining fantasies and having daydreams. And then along with that, one of those strengths would be you. it brings perspective and insight to the mundane. And then if you're low in fantasy, you try to keep your thoughts more realistic. You typically avoid flights of fancy. Um, you don't really let your mind wander as much. You prefer to be productive with your activities instead of drifting into daydreams. And you maybe didn't enjoy make-believe games as a kid as much as others would have. But then one of those the strengths would be is that you're a more practical person. Yeah, so um, how did I score in fantasy? I scored... You scored high. I scored high. One standard deviation above the mean. <laughs> Maddie, you scored one one standard deviation above the mean. Yeah. Kyle, you scored average. And I did not like uh, make-believe games as a kid. <laughs> you did not? Okay. I did not. And Matt, you scored high. Yes. Okay. I did enjoy make-believe games. You did? Mm-hmm. I enjoyed them. I still... I still do with my kids. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I enjoy a good fantasy book, like Space Fantasy. Dune was one of my favorite novels. Um, I was into Harry Potter. Yeah. I wanted to get a letter. I thought I would get one. And then when I was 11 and I didn't get one, I was crushed. (laughs) Oh. That's cute. Okay. Let's go to the next one, aesthetics. So, so yeah, yeah, so for aesthetics, if you're high in aesthetics, um, you can easily get absorbed into music. You could experience chills and excitement from reading poetry or looking at art. Um, so like a physical response, basically, which is cool. And you could be fascinated by different kinds of music and intrigued by patterns and different things. And then and so a strength that goes with that is you can find beauty in small and seemingly insignificant things and you're more insightful. And then low for aesthetics, you're not as interested in the arts. You're not really moved by poetry. It's not your jam. Um, You find ballet and modern dancing boring, um, but a strength of that would be you're more regimented and logical and you rely on facts. Yeah. So I have one patient who's a musician who's two standard deviations high in this. Hmm. And she's incredibly moved by poetry, music, and arts, and it just totally brings her alive. 
And then the other partner is very low in openness, very practical or aesthetics, specifically aesthetics. So not as interested in the arts and stuff. Yeah. So it's like, how do you get these people to interact together? Yeah. I'm very high in this. I'm, I scored about one and a half standard deviations above the mean. Um, how did you guys score? I was high too. I was high. A very high. high. Mm-hmm. So, Matt was very high. Very high. Yeah, and it, it, it fits. I, I really enjoy writing. I enjoy poetry, um, music. I have my little audiophile headphones. And the best thing in the world is to be reading a book and listening to high quality music. And uh, yeah, it's a good time. Yeah. Cool. Yep. So me and you, Matt, are very similar. To about you're, you're, a little, you're two standard deviations above the mean. I'm one and a half. Mm-hmm. Probably because poetry has never been something that, I don't know, I think if I had a great poetry teacher, I think I could have gotten more into it. (laughs) So I probably scored those a little bit more negatively. (laughs) Okay, so what about the third one, feelings? Feelings. If you're high in feelings, you experience many emotions and feelings, and your mood is influenced by scents or names of distant places, so that can like, those are connections for you. Um, You perceive strong emotions as vital to life, and rely on your gut instinct. And a strength of that is that you exhibit empathy very easily. And then for low on feelings, you rarely exhibit strong emotions, um, seldom notice internal feelings, uh, don't notice moods and feelings of different environments so much, like it's not a connection for you. And then a strength of that is that you're not easily influenced by feelings. So so you can be more logical or rational or... yeah. Um, when that's when that's a strength, not right? swayed by your emotions. Yeah. So, how did you guys score on this one? I think we all scored very high, except for Matt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, you're scoring a little lower on this. I'm surprised. Matt's more stable. Yeah. yeah. I. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Yeah. So Matt scored about half a standard deviation above the mean. Kyle, you scored wow two standard deviations above the mean. I feel like it's really easy for me to like feel what a patient's feeling. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That surprises me actually. <laughs> but now I can yeah. see that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. You, so you can read people, you can feel into other people's experience very easily. Maddie also scored very high in that. Yeah. Two standard deviations. So both of you two standard deviations above the mean. I was also two standard deviations above the mean. Yeah. yeah. When I did the the other personality test, I was a feeler and I scored like 20 out of 20 on feelings. So Okay. Like typical for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I make decisions based on how I feel about things. Most therapists I know are higher in this. Yeah. And um and we'll talk about it later, but you can have some countertransference to someone who's very low in it. I think I think until like maybe the last 5 years or so it's been harder for me to connect with someone really low. And feelings and low and openness in general. And so, yeah, we could talk about that. Okay. And uh, next one is actions. So break down what is high and low and mm-hmm. what is actions. For actions, high would be um, believing in variety and everything. You enjoy trying new and foreign foods and enjoy learning new hobbies. <laughs> um, a strength of that is that you're less afraid of thinking outside of the box and you embrace new experiences. So for low, um, you're more set in your personal patterns. You like going to the same places on vacation. You prefer the familiar more than different things. You rely on old-fashioned methods and stick to the same routes of travel. Like if you go the same way to work every day versus like trying to pick different ways to spice it up. Um, A strength of that, though, is um, you're more content with simple aspects of life. And then you don't need um, thrill to achieve, achieve satisfaction. Why are you laughing? You're laughing at me, aren't yeah. you? Because <laughs> we talked about this when you asked me if I thought you were high or low in openness. I said yep. low. And it's because the only thing I knew about you is that you get the same, you go to Stell's for lunch every day and you always get the same thing. Yeah. It's, um, I, I think once I find what I really <laughs> like, I just, I just want the same thing. Because you prefer the familiar. Yeah. I don't know if it's I prefer the familiar because I do enjoy learning new hobbies, um, I do like trying new things, but I think on the day-to-day basis, I really like what I like. Yeah. It's just funny because this is the only place you scored low in openness is actions. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. (laughs) 
Um, I scored, yeah, I scored. So I scored one standard deviation below the mean. How did you score? I scored very high. I like doing different things. Like yeah. I don't like doing the same thing. Yep. Um, I like taking different routes to work if I can find them. <laughs> I like that's changing funny. like things around the house and my husband's super low in openness. So that's like, I think it stresses him out a little sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Why are you changing this? It was good the way it was. I'm like, but it's boring the way it was. Kyle, you scored lower than me. Yeah, I love about routine. That? I used to eat the same thing for breakfast for years. There you go. Yeah, my um, husband does the same thing. I just, I just, you know, I like trying new things also, but I, I feel like to really know something, you have to do it a lot and mm. get good at it, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, for my, me, it's like um, once I found like what my, just what I liked profile wise for coffee, this is so millennial of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't like the really fruity kind. I like, you know, I like a certain amount of earthiness, found you know, chocolate. <laughs> huh? Found my coffee. Yeah. Starbucks overburnt. Don't love it. Hate it. Um, Basically, this is like promoting Stells, this podcast. Stells, yeah. So if you, if you want good coffee, <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you sign up for my Patreon, I'll send you some coffee with, with, uh, if if you if you if you want okay so um and and how did you score and what did you think about that matt i was average i i think it fits i do enjoy trying new foods and everything um but definitely do the same route to work every day i enjoy the the simple things so i i could see a, a good mixture there I think my girlfriend would score really high in this. Like whenever we have like an evening or an afternoon, she wants to do a bunch of new things. I'm like, can we just do one new thing? You know what I mean? Yeah. And then. Yeah, I feel like it can be a point of contention for couples sometimes. Oh, yeah. The actions one specifically. Yeah. Yeah. If, because like there's, it's like, I know I'm going to be happy if I eat at a couple different restaurants. I know exactly yeah. what I want. But you know, it's like, oh gosh, okay. It's if I'm paying for babysitters, paying for a night out, you know, it's like, okay, do I really want to risk yeah, going to some place? Right. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, when we're on vacation, I'll risk it. I'll look at Yelp reviews. I'll kind of try to get like an, a feeling for like what everyone else likes. Like, so I'm kind of swayed by that. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Uh, ideas. So ideas, if you're high, you enjoy entertaining theories and abstract ideas. You enjoy mind twister type puzzles and games and a wide range of interests involving intellect. And a strength of that is that you're intellectually curious. So low for ideas, you'd find philosophical arguments boring. You have little interest in matters of the universe and human condition. And you don't engage as much in conversations about abstract theoretical matters. And a strength of that is that you wouldn't overcomplicate things. Okay. Yeah. And probably the strength is, you know, if you're doing a job that's like your husband, like a diesel mechanic, mm -hmm. like being lower in that, you know, it's just kind of like, okay, you might enjoy it more. Yeah. He definitely does. He likes the structure of it. Yeah. And you have to do it the same way every time. Yep. A uh, policeman, you know, firemen, EMTs are lower in this kind of stuff usually. Yeah. If they're higher in it, then they you know, may not enjoy their work that sort of the day to day. Yeah. They might get more bored by it because they want the, the more abstract part. Yeah. So what do you think I scored? Let's see. How did I score? I scored almost, yeah, I scored one and a half standard deviations above the mean. Hmm. So I was high. Matt, I would put you really high. Yeah, you are. I was very high. <laughs> yes. Very high. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kyle, you're very high too. So both of you are two standard deviations above the mean. Maddie is average. Average. Yeah. I like okay. I don't like talking about like philosophical things as much. Like it stresses me out. Hmm. So I think that's where my husband and I like connected because I you know, like when I'm with him, I take a break from like all the medical school stuff and thinking about things more abstractly and we just talk about concrete things like food and dogs and stuff like that cool yeah yeah but i feel like like i was saying before i feel like um having a higher level of education which is shown in research it usually correlates with higher ideas yep the facet of openness just because you have to like thinking more abstractly to go through all those levels of education mm -hmm. yeah and 
I, I'm remembering back to when I changed light bulbs all summer, <laughs> like eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. One summer I changed light bulbs. And like in my mind, I would have like fantasies going on. I would have stories going on. I would be thinking about ideas. I'd be thinking about the future. So even when I was doing something that was very sort of repetitive, I was like somewhere else in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so if you're like, if you're in a job and you're listening to this and you're like, yeah, the job is pretty repetitive, you know, think about how you might find a job where you're able to use that skill. Cause yeah. I feel like creating podcasts and stuff, I'm able to use sort of my higher ideas. Mm -hmm. Cause like, I think in both ways, it's a skill. It's a skill if you, if it's low, cause you can do those types of jobs, but if it's high, you want to have it more, you want to be stimulated and. Yeah. Yeah. Ideally, I mean. In the in the in the best of all worlds, you find a job that kind of fits your yeah. personality. Um, so you know, if you're very gregarious and you're outgoing, and you're an extrovert, right, or ex high in extroversion, high, and maybe you know, sales makes more sense, yeah. right? Whereas if you're very low in those things, you know, being someone who's on the phone talking to strangers all day may be like completely exhausting. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I would be exhausted. So if you're very, very low in that, you know, a librarian or something where you're able to kind of not interact with as mm -hmm. many people, you know, so thinking about like jobs in terms of personality profiles. Is, yeah. Yeah. It's cool. I found fun. a paper that we can talk about later that talks about like using it in career advisement. Yeah. Which That's is really one. cool. I think it makes sense. Okay, let's go on to the last domain of values. Values. High in values means you believe laws and social policies should be flexible. You're more broad-minded and tolerant, and you believe everyone has a different version of right and wrong. So strengths for that would be you're more flexible and willing to hear other people's perspectives. If you're low in values, it means you rely on religious authorities for decisions regarding moral issues. You believe people need to have a concrete set of values by a young age. You prefer to stick to ingrained principles, and you perceive controversial speakers as troublesome for students. I thought that one was interesting. And then you believe in a traditional set of values. So a strength for that would be you're more loyal and committed and not as easily swayed from your beliefs. Good. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. How did I score on values? I scored one standard deviation above the mean. Okay. And Matt, how did you score on that? I think I was average on that, um, which sort of surprises me because I think that intellectually I would like to fit into the higher side of things with mm -hmm. ethics and different concepts of justice and, uh, you know, social policies that, that really appeals to me. But um, I guess more more things came out about my, you know, religious background and um, things like that that sort of pulled me back to the middle. Yeah. yeah. If you remember, Matt was the one who did the three-part free will, free will series. So you can um, remember his him from there. And uh, yeah, I can kind of see you middle of the road here. Mm. Because I think you do really appreciate having values that are like sort of objective. But then you, I think you also have a value of um, wanting to hear other people's perspectives. So I think you probably are middle of the road, right? Not okay. Kyle, how did you score? I scored low. You scored low. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I think like cognitively, I'm very open to other ideas and other beliefs, but I I very much think there is like a right and wrong, not necessarily different version for other people. Um, and yeah, and like I said, I when I do, I'm I think I'm pretty good at entertaining other like um, uh, kind of understanding people's situation and stuff, but it's a cognitive thing. My gut reaction is this is right or this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Maddie? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting to see how people's faith plays into this one. Um, Cause like for me, I have like a very strong value system for myself, but I do like to constantly like compare it to other people's. Like I'm open to hearing other people's opinions, even though I feel like you should definitely have a certain one that you hold to. But mm -hmm. yeah, so it's interesting to look at that one for me because I definitely am more flexible just with like hearing other people's perspectives and feeling like they could have a different set of values. Like I might not necessarily agree with them, but I don't usually try to like 
put my own beliefs on them and tell mm-hmm. them, no, there's one way to do things unless they like ask me <laughs> my personal opinion. So it's interesting to see how it like is different for everybody. Yep. Like even though we all more or less have the same faith uh, background, it's interesting to see how our value personality can be different. Yeah, your your values is one standard deviation above the mean as well. Yeah, like mine. And uh, I think I think being a psychiatrist has probably increased my flexibility because mm-hmm. just hearing people's stories over yeah. and over again, it's like you you realize like okay, people have come to their sort of places in life uh, for reasons, and just being willing to sort of put my own. Uh, preconceived notions on the back burner and just kind of like seek to understand their perspective. Mm-hmm. It's it's one of my values and why I love the therapeutic alliance and yeah. why I love empathy and stuff like that. So, okay, let's, um, let's keep going. Okay. So Maddie, does openness <laughs> throughout life change? Yeah. So we looked into this and Matt kind of did a deeper dive into this part. So I was going to let him yeah. take the reins okay. for this, but I'll jump in as well. Matt, tell sure. us what you found. Yeah. So I found some interesting things. Um, first off, it's interesting that across multiple countries and age ranges, people seem to have the same basic understanding of how openness changes throughout their life. The lay belief is that, you know, the young are impulsive, rebellious, uh, undisciplined, whereas as we age, we have lower impulsivity, lower activity, and also decreased in openness. And they found that was a consistent belief across cultures. Um, As far as the actual data show is is if openness changes or not, um, they did do some studies on um, teenagers, so 12 to 18 years old. And they found that there was growth in openness for both boys and girls. And uh, there was no consistent changes over that time frame in conscientiousness, extroversion, or agreeableness. Yeah, that was interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And I pulled out the table because I felt that was interesting. You know, you had 5% of people had from 12 to 16 had decrease in openness whereas 43% had increase and 51% no change. Whereas if you look at the other types of personality, pro, you know, types like neuroticism, you get like 20% decrease, 20% increase. So yeah. there is some movement, but it's about the same in both directions. It's interesting, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that has a lot to do with like um, some aspects of openness and cognitive function and how like the brain is developing during that time. Yeah. Okay. What about what about childhood adversity? Does childhood adversity make someone less open or more open? Uh, it's associated with an increase in levels of openness, which was really interesting to me. I'm not sure if that would have been the result I expected. Yeah, I'm I'm not surprised by that. Actually, I think that there are, I've met a lot of people who have had really rough childhoods that do have very very strong feelings. Um, they have, they have this kind of like, sometimes it's, it's the openness would be like two or three standard deviations above the mean. Hmm. Wow. And I wonder, I wonder about that. Yeah. So that kind of makes sense to me. Yeah. I wonder if it goes back to what you said before, how like people who have gone through a lot, like they just have a, I feel like their openness might go up just because they know that everybody's experience might be different from theirs. You know, like they could see more about like, oh, you must have been through a lot. I could see how you would get this way. Like more flexibility, knowing that people experience different things. And that would be like in the values section. Yeah, I think that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Also, also think about like fantasy. I've had a lot of patients who deal with traumatic childhoods um, with a lot of fantasy Mm. or they deal with some deprivation, like adult deprivation with a lot of fantasy. Yeah. So they go internal. They have like all these rich Um, worlds that allow them to kind of escape. Yeah. Okay. Um, Openness and education. What did we find? Yeah. So this was interesting. Uh, Finding in this study that openness was positively associated with entry into college. However, 
the part that I found was more interesting is that even though college seems to be selective for higher levels of openness, uh, this study compared um, those who entered college with those who did uh, vocational training. And they found that even though the starting points were different on openness, that over the course of the study, the changes in openness both increased were of similar trajectory for college and vocational training. So there might be a selective factor in, you know, how in the starting points, but both do change and in the similar direction. Yeah, they both, it seems like, um, and it's not a huge increase in the standard deviations between the two groups. Um, you're looking at what, like a, like I'm looking at this, um, this graph, you know, it's about maybe like a 0.3, if that standard deviation between them when they start yeah. college. And that, that, so that dip distance between them stays about the same, but they both increase a little bit with time. Mm -hmm. Um, interestingly, people who extroversion, not as much difference between the two groups. Um, and they kind of mirror each other as well. Conscientiousness, they, they have the same starting point. But interestingly, they both go up and the non-college goes up even higher than the college. Yeah, interesting. Which maybe is because those people are paying bills. They're yeah. living life, you know? Agreeableness, about the same. They both have some increase. And neuroticism, people in college, uh, a little bit less neurotic, but only like a 0.1 difference. So the, the, the biggest difference here is actually openness. It's about a 0.3 between yeah, the two groups. between the groups. Okay, what about decreased openness in adulthood? What did they find? So this study was interesting. Uh, I'm sure there are additional studies out there and some reviews I read uh, stated that it wasn't quite as clear cut as it always seems. But in this study, it was a longitudinal study and they followed openness in uh, participants uh, that ranged anywhere between 30 and 90 years old. And um, they found that there is relative stability uh, among a number of the subsections within openness, but values, actions, and feelings were the three subsections that showed the steepest decline as associated with age. Okay, so let's think about that. So, va so this, this is interesting because if you look within the domain of openness, you now have the fish are flowing in two slightly different directions, okay? So interestingly, when they, when they did the initial study of openness, they found that you know openness as a group kind of flowed together. The fish were all going in the same direction. But now we're seeing as, as people grow older, there's certain domains of openness which are staying about the same and certain ones that are decreasing. So the ones that are decreasing are what? Let's go through one, one by one. Values. Values uh, decreasing. So that means that um, they're not as likely to, you know, think that there are different social standards and different policies. Yeah, they're more they likely to think less flexible, mm -hmm. less, less, less flexible, kind of more like set in stone, like, okay, I, I think this is the truth. This is reality. This is the way things are more traditional beliefs. I mean, you see more people who are older, who are attending like religious organizations and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So, okay. And then what's the other one that's actions. decreases? Actions. So people know what they want, mm -hmm. right? They find the spot they like to go for vacation. Right. They figure out their coffee profile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what's the third one? Feelings. Feelings. And so that's decreased a little bit, huh? So yeah, that, that does make sense. Because sometimes you'll see like people with borderline personality disorder, they'll just kind of have some of them as they get older, it's like less intense, the the mood swings, the emotions. Interesting. Often throughout life, you learn kind of ways of coping with it naturally, right? Mm -hmm. More support structures that sort of maybe buttress the uh, the intensity of the emotions. Do you think it could even just be like hormonal changes too? Like, I feel like when you're young, you go through maybe a yeah, lot more like a roller coaster. Decrease than in if testosterone. Like, yeah. Decrease in, um, you know, like through menopause and stuff like yeah, that. I yeah, just that's, that's interesting. I just imagine if I stopped having periods, I probably wouldn't have quite as many emotional changes. Who well, knows? I don't know because some Who people knows? who are postmenopausal do and have a lot. And then it's lot. worse, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You know, okay, mood is influenced by sense and names of diff distant places. So maybe they're just less influenced. Okay, 
Yeah. So some of those are decreasing. All the other ones are staying the same. It's interesting. Uh, and then moving on, there's another interesting as, you know, talking about sort of aging and changes, the concept of partner selection comes up. And this study found that when people are considering what they want in a romantic partner, the trait out of um, all of the big five that they want to be most similar on is openness. They find that to be most important. And granted, this um, could be because they want their partner to have higher of other values or lower of um, some of these uh, personality factors, but they specifically want to match well on similar levels of openness. Wow, that's interesting. Um, it almost makes me think if you were running a dating app, some way of assessing openness. Yeah, if you had everyone do the personality test. If you were just to assess openness and then create matches based off of openness and maybe some other facets, that might actually create some good matches. Yeah. We should trademark that really quick. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, um, dear. Uh, Trent, cut that from the audio. <laughs> yes, Trent's my audio guy. We'll leave that in there. Um, yeah, interesting. And then uh, if people are high in openness, uh, when they, overall, they are less likely to get married or to postpone their first marriage and then subsequently are less likely to become parents or more likely to do so later in life. Yeah, I thought that was interesting too. Yeah. Okay, what's next? Uh, last thing to talk about over life is uh, sort of career choices. Mm -hmm. And this seems to reflect some of the things that we talked about earlier on with um, higher scores on openness being related with artistic and investigative occupations, with lower scores being more correlated to realistic and conventional occupations. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, so this was the study I was talking about where it, it talked about career counseling, too. And um, basically, they said that there's instances where they could still be making the right decision. But as a counselor, you would want to guide them and figure out, are you making a good decision if the career choice you have doesn't align with your level of openness? Like, are you going to be satisfied? Because usually you're more satisfied if you choose one that kind of fits better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that I think... I just want to put out there is to not um, is to not put your own sort of openness onto other people, right? So we can think that people, our natural inclination is to think that people think pretty similar to the way that we think. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, when I go to order my Stells, I check in with Maddie and see if she changed her mind and she usually has <laughs> for what she wants for the day. <laughs> Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. But that's why this is so cool for like therapy because it reminds you that they might not think the same way as you. Yeah. Yep. It's a great, it's a cool. It's a, it's a, it's a good construct to think in because then you can think about like, oh, okay, where does this person fall in line with these yeah. different domains? And then how does that relate to maybe what they might be interested in doing? Mm -hmm. Or like you said, with couples therapy, like it can help couples see how each other are different and relate better. Okay, let's get into genetics. Yeah, so the genetics one was interesting. Um, it's not like as concrete as some of the other personality traits. It's like they haven't done a ton of research on it. Mm -hmm. But basically one of the things that they found was that it's the the only one of all the big five personalities that wasn't associated with either sex. It was like it, it didn't really make a difference. And okay. then they did find that there was some heritability with it. They found a 21% of variance between individuals explained by a genotyped common variance. Um, but it's like, they're still, they still need to do a lot of research with it. Basically. Mm -hmm. It's like the tip of the iceberg. I think. Yeah. Openness was one of the last personality types to be decided on. Mm -hmm. So there hasn't been as much research on it compared to other ones like neuroticism, especially. Yeah. 21% variance is not very high. Yeah. For genetics. Okay, what about open um, oxytocin pathway yeah. genes? What did you find there? Yeah, so they looked at the oxytocin pathway gene. They found that people who had reduced uh, methylation of the gene tended to score higher on openness to experience. 
And interestingly, interestingly, they found that no other personality trait had that association with the with that specific gene. Right. So the people who had this gene had oxytocin, you know, that was this gene that's unpacked basically. So methylation means you're packing up the gene mm -hmm. so that you're not going to be using that epigenetically. And so this, if you have demethylation, then you have that, you're expressing that. So people who are expressing that tended to be higher in openness. Yeah. Which kind of makes me think oxytocin is kind of bonding. So are you like connecting to things like music, yeah. literature, your oxytocin is going, you're just connecting mm -hmm. to, to everything. Okay, in terms of monozygotic and dizygotic twins, looking back at, back at a study that they did in 1993, they found that those that were reared apart, openness was correlated for monozygotic twins 0.43 and for dizygotic 0.23, whereas when they were reared together, it jumped up to 0.51 for monozygotic and 0.1. One four for dizygotic. So environment looks like it has some impact, but it looks like even when they're reared apart, there's some impact genetically. Mm -hmm. But once again, this is uh, maybe forty percent at the at the max. This study came out it said forty percent at the max was like for the variance, accounting for the genetics. Yeah, it's definitely not as strong of a correlation as some of the other personality traits. Well, this this study actually showed that it was lower for agreeableness and conscientiousness. But like neuroticism was what I was thinking of specifically, or they've shown many times that it's like linked. Okay. Yeah, I agree yeah. with that. Okay, so neuroticism probably the highest. Yeah. They didn't look at neuroticism in this study. Though. In this study, they didn't look at it. This one we're looking at. Yeah, so it's harder to compare. Okay. Let's go into physical health. Kyle, tell me what you found. Well, I, uh, there was this big study, big meta-analysis of nine cohorts, uh, over 78,000 people. They were looking at BMI, uh, like, mm -hmm. you know, development of obesity and personality traits. There was a, like a, a slight decrease in obesity and uh, people in higher and openness, but this went away once you corrected for education. Um, there's really not much connection between uh, openness to experience and, uh, you know, the risk of obesity. This study did find that open people, like people who scored high in openness, tended to eat like a varied diet and a healthier diet, you could argue, but it didn't relate, like it didn't, you know, transfer into a, like a decreased risk for obesity. Uh, basically, only conscientiousness was associated with a decreased risk. This next study, this was a this was a cool study. It's on uh, patients like uh, you know who had uh, nearly a thousand patients who underwent uh, coronary catheterization, uh, and they were looking at kind of risk of death and um, openness as a domain did not have any correlation. But diving into the different facets, openness to feelings and openness to actions were associated with a twenty four percent and a 23% reduction in cardiac death, respectively, mm. and a 17 and 14% reduction in all-cause mortality risk, respectively. Wow, let's think about that. So openness to feelings, 24% reduction in cardiac death risk, and 17% all-cause mortality reduction. Openness to feelings. So those people are in touch with their feelings, they yeah. know what they're feeling, do you think they're able to, you know, regulate their own emotional stress better? Or um, I think they're more aware of their feelings. I, you know, one thought is that a lot of the people have feelings that don't know that they have feelings, so they have a lot of psychological defenses against mm -hmm. the feelings. Whereas, like in therapy, you learn how to like identify your feelings and be able to put words to them. So maybe it's the people who like have that ability rather than just like stuff them down yeah dissociate away from them and then they come out physically they come out physically yeah, right with like higher blood pressure and yep yep and then the other aspect that reduced mortality was um openness, openness to, to actions. actions so you know this is something that i scored average in 
So I have a higher risk of death because of that. <laughs> Oh gosh, maybe I shouldn't get the same food every day. <laughs> as long as it's healthy, it doesn't yeah, matter. As long right? as it's a turkey yeah. sandwich. Yeah. That's pretty good. Um there's also a um aesthetics was protective against cardiac death with a fifteen percent reduction risk. So Matt's gonna, okay. gonna be okay. Gonna live forever. <laughs> Actions. So it's like there's something about variety, trying new things. Yeah, listen. And join join learning new things, right? Yeah. Okay. Maybe you like to go outside more and like do or physical things. Yeah, maybe. Well, he's... I don't know. There wasn't that much of an association with physical activity, right? Not really. Yeah, it's interesting. So I wonder what the... Well, yeah. Maybe they're just um, willing to kind of put themselves out there more. Yeah. Build relationships maybe, maybe through that. And when you get older, maybe a little bit higher ability to try new things. Get some new friends or something. Because we know, I know being lonely is a high risk for mortality. Yeah. yeah. So being kind of isolated and alone is one of the highest risks. Okay. So I looked at another study looking at BMI and uh, yeah, no connection at all between openness to experience and risk of BMI. Okay. Uh, conscientiousness seems to be like the most important <laughs> uh, personality trait when it comes to BMI. It would be consci more con higher conscientiousness is like lower BMI? Yeah. High conscientiousness. You know, it's like so someone who's high conscientious will execute a plan better, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they'll diet better or they'll keep with an exercise program better. Yeah. Okay. So this next study, looking at a little over 10,000 Australian adults, uh, they did find that people who are conscientious, no, you know, no surprise, and scored higher in openness, uh, had like predicted subsequent increases in physical activity. Uh, it wasn't a huge effect size, 0.14. So not huge. Uh, that's not much. <laughs> Honestly, that probably doesn't do much for them. Yeah. <laughs> it's like if you study enough people, you're going to get, you're, you'll find something. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, that's a good study size. So, okay. So the next stuff. This had a clear connection uh, out of all the physical, um, like physical health uh, topics. This had the biggest connection and it was predicting marijuana use. Okay. So the study of 300 college students found greater openness to experience and impulsivity were associated with greater marijuana use within the last year with an odds ratio of 1.13 and 1.05 respectively. And Wait, what's the uh, what's the one point one three? Is the, that the openness, greater openness? Yeah, yeah, the openness and impulsivity, one point zero five. Yeah. So impulsivity, interesting, wasn't as highly linked. I was surprised by that. Okay. And uh, openness to experience was also associated with recent marijuana use, like within the last month, of one point zero eight. It almost makes me wonder: is which comes before? Which one comes first, right? That's a good question. Because in later studies, we find like some of these more psychedelics like increase openness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just an association, right? That they found it wasn't like. Yep. So it's not like a, it's not like a predictive yeah. thing. Yeah. So I like this next study because uh, it looks at chronic cannabis users and people who have never used cannabis before. Oh, cool. And looks at openness to experience between the group. And it, there's a huge effect size, well, comparatively, of 0.67. For for what in particular? So for, people who like a, used? Yeah, the, the, the chronic cannabis using group mm -hmm. uh, was much higher in openness mm -hmm. to experience than the never used cannabis group. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that is a big, that is a big jump. I'm looking at the other personality types. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't seem like there's much of a link yeah. between the two. Maybe, oh, cannabis, lower conscientiousness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Quite a bit, actually. Okay. Quite a bit. Quite and a also bit. lower on agreeableness for the chronic A users. little bit lower on agreeableness. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. I wonder if that's why they always, like, get upset when I <laughs> recommend that they stop <laughs> marijuana. They're not agreeable. I'm just joking. 
it's hard as a psychiatrist when I see that someone is being negatively influenced by marijuana and they're also, they have a very strong attachment to marijuana, which is why I did a couple episodes on marijuana in the past showing that it increases risk of psychosis, depression, anxiety. Yeah, I listened to that one. I was surprised that uh, I didn't really think there would be like long-term consequences. And I, I forget the amount of IQ points that drops off for like chronic use. Chronic heavy use over 20 years, it's like, Half a standard deviation. Wow. Mm. That's significant. Or almost half a standard deviation, yeah. Okay. This is your yeah. openness. Let's keep going. Traits. What about traits? Conservative. Are conservatives lower in openness? Yeah, this one was um, interesting. Because basically, I think the, the thought, if you don't look into it too much, is that um, people think that if you're less open, you're more conservative. Because um, it, like, makes sense. Um, you, you're not as flexible in your values. You have a more strict, it's mm -hmm. mostly connected to values, I think, more than other yep. um, traits of openness specifically. So that's why this study wanted to look at that. Yeah, it's an interesting study because they're doing some complex statistical modeling. Yeah. <laughs> which, which honestly, it's like was tying my brain into a yeah. knot. Oh, man. So what were their conclusions? Yeah, basically they said that they're not so sure that um, personality, like openness causes conservatism conservatism versus um, being more liberal. But they did find that um, your openness develops in parallel with your conservatism. So like if you're more conservative, if that changes over time, like if you become more conservative, you'll also, um, your openness will change yeah, with so it. So it's like, which one comes first, Yeah, right? That's do what you, they were asking, yeah. Do you choose to become conservative and then... Because you're less be, open? Because you're less open? Or do you become less open as you become more conservative? And they see that they kind of like go, they flow together a little bit. Yeah, they did, they did say at the end, um, it seems like openness to experience decreases conservative conservatism more than conservatism decreases openness to experience. Yeah. Openness to experience. Which is like what people think. Right. Yeah. Like if you're more open, you'll probably be less conservative. Yeah. I think, I think it has a lot to do with um, like, as you develop a group identity, Yeah. you often will adopt all of the different aspects of the group identity. I think that's where, and then so there's kind of like group think that occurs more and more in this culture. We see that I would say to like a higher degree than usual ever than I've ever seen it. Yeah. So it's like the set beliefs of a, an identity sort of move you and move you further, further away until you almost think that the other group is completely evil, which is dangerous. Okay. Americans who are hearing this, it's dangerous to believe that. <laughs> All right. You know, I was not impressed by some of the effect sizes, to tell you the truth in this study. It's not like they're huge, huge mm -hmm. differences. That was one thing that jumped out to me. So, you know, how clinically relevant is this? Maybe a little bit, right? Yeah. Maybe a little bit. Like, I think, I think when we get to the extremes, like two and three standard deviations, one way or the other, is where you'll meet someone who's like very, very fixed in yeah. their beliefs. And it's like, okay, what is your, um, what is the counter-transference that may occur when you meet someone who's of your opposite political yeah. ideology? Yeah, as a therapist. Um, maybe it, you, you can have a little bit decreased counter-transference by thinking it might be related to some of the degree, their openness, right? And so can you see can you see them for um, who they are? You know, interestingly, if you think about jobs that tend to run more conservative, they tend to be more like um, blue collar jobs. All the policemen, yeah. firefighters, those tend to be more conservative. Decent mechanics, right? Whereas you think about like people who are super high openness, maybe like your college professor mm -hmm. tend to be more liberal. I think it's like something like 95% of college professors are liberal or something yeah. like that. Okay. Yeah. How about love and work? 
Yeah, this study was interesting. They just had the question of like, how does openness play into um, how a person loves and how they work? Um, so it was it was a cool study. They they like Kyle was saying, they basically had to look at facets to see how it played into it, and they saw that their intellectual interests um, were predictive of positive educational outcomes, while their aesthetic interests um, unconventionally predicted. Winding an autonomous career path. So if you are more higher, more high on aesthetics, you are more likely to have a less straightforward career path. Like you would try different things before finding your what you mm-hmm. liked to do. But if you are higher on the like the intellectual side, you're more likely to have like a higher level of education, basically. Mm-hmm. And then so like they were saying, they found that openness plays a difference, but it wasn't like openness overall. You had to go into the the facets of openness. Um, and then they also said that it changes into adulthood and that seemed to be a bigger factor, like how it changed more than just what level you are at at any point in time. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so then one of the things I forgot to mention that they said as far as um, love was concerned, where did it go? If you're higher in openness, you're more likely, which another study said, you're more likely to delay romantic commitment. Um, and you're more likely to, you put less of an emphasis on extrinsic rewards like salary. Um, so if you're higher in openness, you might like try different careers or careers that maybe don't make as much money. And then you're also, you might not like get married as soon as other people, which that other study said too. Yeah. Yeah. It's very like complicated. Mm-hmm. It's not like super straightforward. Like it, like op- since openness changes so much over your lifetime, you can't just like look at someone at one point in time and say, this is how your life is going to go. You have to look at how it changes. Yeah. And once again, partners tend to have similar openness scores. Yeah. One study showed that people generally desire partners high in openness. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. It's like, that's like, oh, I want someone who wants to try new things and explore. Yeah, I feel like everyone says that. That's what they always say, like, on The Bachelor and Bachelorette. Like, right. I want someone yeah. who's going to explore the world with me. Yeah. Not go to the same place. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> imagine, <laughs> imagine me on, like, a date. Uh, yeah, I, this is the only coffee that I like. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's like... Day 10, it's like, so you get the same sandwich. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. It's like over time, you just know what you love, you know? Yeah. Like avocados. I like Haas avocados. Yeah, me too. Other kinds, not as much. (laughs) I really like Haas. It's fattier. It's better. It's a millennial thing to say. Okay. (laughs) It's the uh, avocado toast. I I call it. content for me. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer like 23% fat. So if it's like picked right at the end of the season, that's like the best. <laughs> so you can, that's the wonderful thing about coffee. You can have this conversation with coffee and you're not crazy. Because you yeah. can talk, I but want this origin avocados. from this elevation. But if it's yeah. avocados. <laughs> yeah, I like, um, I like my dark chocolate, yeah. like Guatemalan. Because it's a little bit more earthy than the like the Dominican Republic. <laughs> okay. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> so for this next study, they looked into life event life events and abuse, and they found that openness was significantly positively correlated with abuse, like a history of abuse. Yeah. And they also found that childhood abuse, openness to experience, and extroversion um, together were significantly positively correlated with negative life events, which was interesting. Hmm. Okay. Academic performance. What did you find there? For academic performance, so this was like a meta-analysis. They found that only two of the six openness facets were positively related to academic performance. It was ideas and values which I think makes sense that those two would be and the mm-hmm. other ones weren't weren't positively related. Yeah. Ideas and values. Yeah. Yeah, that one that one made sense to me. It wasn't um This next section I think is 
it's it's really really fun this is the um, good stuff this is the good stuff okay guys if you've listened so far congratulations <laughs> you made it you made it psychopathology let's talk about psychosis psychosis so interesting so interesting so with psychosis they looked at like two sort of brain areas yeah this one was more complicated uh, that's why i looked at it yeah <laughs> Okay, tell me what you found, and then I'll tell you what I think. Uh, um, basically, they found a link between psychosis and openness, which was interesting to me. Higher levels of openness were associated with psychosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's two different sort of networks that they looked at. They looked at the default network, which is like anything that requires the simulation of experience rather than attention to current sensory input. That's like the default network. So simulation of experience. And they found that increased connectivity and activity of the default network has been observed in patients with schizophrenia and in people at high risk for psychosis. Um, and during tasks. So this seems to be elevated in people with schizophrenia or at risk for psychosis. Mm -hmm. And what they found, importantly, the relation of schizophrenia, you know, to this default network connectivity appears to be specifically linked to positive symptoms of psychosis. And they found that relatives of those with schizophrenia also show increased connectivity of the default network. Mm. That's interesting to me. Yeah. So there's like that sort of genetic link there. Yeah. And greater connectivity of the default network is seen among individuals who report more frequent mind wandering and higher levels of creativity, which are both correlated with positive symptoms of schizotypy. So, you know, additionally, the default network connectivity has been found to be positive related to individuals, individual differences in openness. So people who are higher in openness have this higher level of the uh, activity of the default network. Mm -hmm. And um, if, you're, if you're wanting some numbers, so default network coherence positively predicted openness with a beta of 0.21 and um, positively correlated with uh, different psychotic type of things, 0.25. Okay, the second sort of brain network that they looked at was called the frontal parietal control network, mm -hmm. which is primarily nodes in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, lateral parietal cortex, and dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. And it appears responsible for voluntary control of attention and has been shown to exhibit reduced functional connectivity in those with psychosis. So there's this link, right, between psychosis and a disturbed function of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. So what they found is a negative effect size between different psychotic stuff and the frontal parietal control network. It was 0.32, negative 0.32. And they found a similar negative value in openness. Yeah. Of point, negative 0.25. Yeah, so both psychoticism and openness related to the different areas the same way. Yeah. Which kind of makes me think like, okay, so you know, you have like some advantage of being more open, creativity, you know, ability to think abstractly, right? So yeah. in certain environments, that's going to be very good. Push that to the extreme, you know, fantasy becomes... Hallucinations. Hallucinations, right? So it's kind of like, you know, there's there's always positives and negatives mm -hmm. to, different, to different traits. Yeah, they definitely need to do more studies with this, but it's like the question of is there... Does high openness link to schizophrenia and things like that? 
Yeah. What do you think about, because I've always heard when people are describing schizophrenia, they say, okay, well, think about someone who breaks like in college, like early mm -hmm. college. And that's always been described to me as like based on their age. But I wonder if we think about this thing with openness, if that's based on the fact that they're in college as well, because they're already selecting for higher openness. Since they're in college, they are having more education. And I wonder if this link we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, it uh, with... Schizophrenia tends to actually be linked to lower IQ. So it's it's more rare to have a high functioning schizophrenic. I think it's just that much more devastating when it when it happens to like mm -hmm. the individual, right? Because it's often the individual who sees what their potential could have been and then they develop the schizophrenia. There's a lot of links between like uh, cognitive decline and schizophrenia. Yeah. And, and um, different things like the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex not functioning as well, right? Like that planning area, yeah, stuff like that. So, you know, I do have patients who are very high functioning, who have schizophrenia, who are on medications, who are doing well, who are able to, you know, do graduate school and stuff like that. Mm. Like they're functioning really well, but their pre-morbid function coming into it was very high, you know, mm. so. You know, it's interesting to me, like we saw that study that um, people who used marijuana had increased openness. And like if you use marijuana, sometimes you can develop symptoms of schizophrenia earlier. It, yeah. It, no, it, well, it increases your risk of developing yeah, so psychotic maybe, illness. Maybe period. there's a link with openness. Maybe. That. Yeah. That would be really interesting to look at. Yeah. For some person out there who needs a, needs a doctoral dissertation, <laughs> right? Okay. All right, dementia. What did you find with dementia? Yeah, for dementia, um, they were looking at the overlap between openness and cognitive functioning, and they found that openness is a better predictor of activity diversity than of time spent engaged in activities or time spent um, in cognitively challenging activities. And then they saw that activity diversity explained significant variance in the relationship between openness and cognitive ability. So basically, they saw that participating in a more diverse array of activities was most beneficial for those with less formal education. Um, so hmm. they were looking at, like, can you, can you help someone decrease their risk for dementia? And they found that... Um, since you can't you can't change their education level per se for people with a lower education level participating in a more diverse array of activities could be beneficial for decreasing your risk of dementia and it related to openness okay so i need to diversify my activities basically that's what yeah. you're saying yeah that's what the study said like it can it could be a it could be a help for people yeah that's good yeah what about depression in medical students what do they find yeah, this one was interesting. They found that depression was seen to be associated with openness and agreeableness. And they found that the medical students who were more open were less likely to develop depression. Hmm. Yeah. So it's associated with openness, 0.241. So, but then it's also students who are less adjusting, more open, and more agreeable are also less likely to develop depression. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So like one of the things with the study was they wanted to like look at medical students coming in and use the personality inventory mm -hmm. to like help guide like what kind of support they might need, right. what their risk factors were for depression. So if they were less open, they might have higher risk for depression. So they might need to be given more support. So like future research, like can we use personality traits to guide? Yeah. Um, like risk management, more or less. These associations are very small. Yeah. Right? So that would be like, that would, I, I don't think I would run this study in the future. It's probably not how I would screen people for risks, honestly. Uh, neuroticism, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Neuroticism would be a good one. To it's it's the most linked to depression. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about anxiety in college? Yeah, um, for anxiety in college, they looked at 
the stressful situation of entering professional curriculum and found that it was marked by a combination of decreased openness to experience and increased extroversion in the great majority of normal students and those with anxiety. So they also found that um, people who had decreased extroversion and openness, both of those together, they're more likely to spend their time alone. So they kind of thought that having a good balance of extroversion and openness to experience was essential for psychological resilience. Um, so like, cause you're less likely to kind of keep to yourself and have mm -hmm. less like positive coping skills. Okay. Yeah. Interestingly, they, they, they say that there's like this alexithymia, like an inability to know your own emotions, your own experience, you know, yeah. that's like the very low feelings. Yeah. Right. And, I've met some people who are are alexithymic, but they have emotions, right? So you mm -hmm. see it on their face, you see yeah. it on their micro expressions. They're flashing the emotions; they just have no clue what they're feeling. And yeah. so, I help those people by you know getting in touch with what they're feeling in their body, get them talking about something that makes them angry, get them to feel it in their body. That helps them, you know, like what do you feel in your chest? Do you feel tight in your chest? Yes, I do actually. What does that mean? That might mean that you are frustrated. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's helpful. Okay. Yeah, that's basically what they were saying. Like in order to have some resilience, you need to be more aware of your feelings. So people with low openness seem to be a little bit less aware. Mm -hmm. um, so they were at higher risk for developing symptoms. Okay, what else? Um, yeah. So maybe uh, let's go on to ASD. ASD. Autism spectrum disorder? Yeah. They basically found a negative correlation between the severity of autism and openness to experience, which I just thought was interesting. So they're more, they're less, if they're more severe autistic. They're less open. They're less open. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense because they're very regimented, mm -hmm. right? They're very, um, they like the routines. They get very upset when their routines are broken. Mm -hmm. Very upset. Okay. Yeah, that one that one makes sense. I thought that was interesting. How about schizophrenia and borderline personality disorder? Yeah, for those, um, they found high genetic correlations between extroversion and ADHD, and between openness and schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. So they found genetic correlations between openness and schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. So higher openness with schizophrenia or lower? Yeah, openness? higher. And bipolar, higher or lower? I think it was also higher. Okay. Yeah. Interesting they found um, ADHD was linked to extroversion. Yeah. But it makes sense. They're more gregarious. Yeah. It's like if I'm sitting in front of a person who thinks they're ADHD, but they look depressed and they're very low energy individual, I tend to think this person is more depressed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What about migraines and depression? Yeah, this one was really interesting. So they found that openness to experience was significantly lower in the co-occurrence of migraines and depression. Um, so people who had migraines and depression at the same time had lower openness. So then it suggested that increased openness might decrease the risk of the co-occurrence of depression and migraines. And so they were thinking it would provide valuable insight for newer prevention and intervention approaches in the treatment of these conditions. Um, so basically thinking like if you can um, change their level of openness, maybe you can change their risk for depression and migraines. Huh. Yeah. Well, I think about in general psychosomatic type of things, you know, where you're stuffing your emotions into your body you know, you might have more body pains. And then if you're able to kind of like process the emotions as they happen, yeah. be congruent with your inner experience, congruent meaning your inner experience matches your outer experience. Because um, yeah, if you look at the, um, I put the, the graphs on the next page, mm -hmm. it's pretty different. Wow. Yeah. So as you, yeah, explain this graph to me or put it into words that would make sense to someone <laughs> listening to a podcast. Basically, um, they compare openness to like having migraines and not having migraines. And um, 
And then so they compared it also to having depression. So there's three different things going on in this thing. And people who had depression and migraines had a lot lower openness than um, people who had migraines without depression. And then um, so like if you have a migraine, if you also have depression, your low your openness is going to be lower. If you have migraines but you don't have depression, you have higher openness. And then um, – if you don't have migraines but you have depression, they had higher openness. Um, and then, yeah, <laughs> it's confusing. crazy. I know. Oh, okay. Go on the website. Look at this thing yourself. Yeah. If this is interesting to you. Um, it's in the resource library. Okay. Yeah. They basically wanted to see, like, can you help treat people with migraines and depression by looking at their openness? Yeah. So concluding remarks on this study, Did they, what did they conclude? that you could or couldn't help them by looking at their openness. Yeah. They were thinking that like, maybe you can, um, maybe you can, like if they have depression and migraines, can you work on changing their levels of openness, um, as part of treatment, like doing therapy basically. Okay. All right. Treatment resistant depression and low openness. Yeah. This one was cool too. For people with treatment-resistant depression, um, they had lower openness, lower levels of openness. Yeah. Find the, it was harder to treat them. Yeah. Basically, they want, yeah. they were thinking as like um, doing the – looking at openness to see like kind of like gauging how you should treat patients with depression. So like if they have low openness, they're more likely to be treatment-resistant. Yeah, they, they concluded this newly identified trait should be included as a risk factor in treatment-resistant yeah. depression. It's really interesting. Yeah. Okay, so tell me about this uh, ketamine study. What did they find? Yeah, this was really interesting. So they found that um, someone with high openness, it significantly predicted a sustained treatment outcome when they were treating patients with treatment-resistant depression with long-term ketamine therapy. So if you have a patient with treatment-resistant depression, if they have high openness, they're more more likely to have a sustained treatment outcome if you try ketamine therapy with them. Yeah, it, and this is um, this is substantial. It's like almost mm -hmm. like a two times more likely. Yeah, I've never seen any studies like this. So I think this is really kind of going along with that prior research that low openness was a significant mediator of treatment-resistant depression. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, someone who's someone who's very depressed, who also has very low openness, they're going to be harder to treat with anything. Yeah. Ketamine, no ketamine. Like one study found that low openness predicted a negative outcome in the use of lithium augmentation therapy. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, in another study, openness did not predict a response to fluoxetine in, in depressed outpatients. So, you know, it's kind of like a mixed, mixed result. So maybe if they're low openness, fluoxetine might be a better option. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Also in deep brain stimulation, openness scores uh, were lower in general, but did not predict antidepressant response. Yeah. So I doubt that any um, ketamine clinics that are, that are run by non-psychiatrists are going to check for openness. <laughs> yeah. They're just, man, they're money mills to some degree, some <laughs> of these places. Uh, if, if you are looking for ketamine treatment, do not go to a non-psychiatrist to get your ketamine because they do not know how, they, you know, they don't treat thousands and thousands of patients with depression. So they're not used to uh, the nuances of depression and what might work or what might not work or what might be the best option. Okay. So let's talk about MDMA. Yeah. And openness. What do they find in um, general? Yeah. In general, they found that there was a relationship between openness and reduced PTSD symptoms with MDMA treatment. So they had a, a treatment. They had eight people taking a placebo doing this MDMA therapy. They had 12 people on MDMA. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, real MDMA ecstasy. This is not street 
ecstasy, which is often laced with all sorts of things like methamphetamines or fentanyl, rarely probably, but it, you know, it could be laced with things. So um, then they did this, this therapy. There was a decrease in the, uh, the CAPS score. Interestingly, the placebo had quite a, quite a substantial decrease too. Yeah. And they showed that there was a decrease in neuroticism and an increase in openness. Mm -hmm. The increase in openness only occurred in the people taking the MDMA. And it wasn't, it wasn't huge. It's like a third of a standard deviation basically is what I see. So they did a T-score openness, started at 56.4, went to 59.7. So three points, three points, which is a third of a standard deviation. Neuroticism decreased from 69 to 59. That's a one standard deviation shift. Interesting. So remember our openness, like some of us are like two standard deviations above the mean, one standard deviation above the mean. So it's like, it would shift, but it would shift very little. Yeah. So it's not like all of a sudden their openness is like, yeah. three standard deviations different. And they listen to poetry and it's like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm connecting with this, right? So, uh, and then any other studies? How about this one on psychedelics? What did you find? Yeah, they found that openness to experience differed between three groups. So they're looking at three groups, people who used psychedelics recreationally people who preferred mdma and then people who didn't use either of them the control group and they found that openness to experience was higher specifically in the psychedelic group compared to both the mdma and control and so were they they were testing people who had who had used the substance who had used it in the and past. they were looking at their levels of openness yeah to yeah. see if like use of either psychedelics or mdma would possibly change your level of openness. Hmm. Yeah. So they found a positive association um, between openness and the lifetime number of psychedelic exposures. Yeah. Okay. Break down what specifically happened in the different domains of openness. Um, yeah. They found that specifically values, actions, and ideas showed a positive association with lifetime psychedelic use which is really interesting. There's an increase in values. Whereas openness to feelings and fantasies were not associated. Yeah, which I thought was interesting because I would have thought maybe fantasy would have changed. Yeah. But it didn't. Okay, and what did we find about this th what therapy increased openness in older adults? Yeah, so um, I thought like looking at therapy would be really interesting with openness to see like how you could use it. So when they the study that looked at um, openness in older adults, they found that you could um, doing some training could maybe change and increase actually their levels of openness. Mm -hmm. So when they compared the group that they were doing training with to the control, their openness after training increased significantly compared to the control. They were doing inductive reasoning training. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So that was the therapy that they gave? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like the the very basic question for this one was like, I think they were looking at um, dementia. Like if you could, if changing mm -hmm. their openness could change their risk of dementia in the future. Yeah. So they found that if you did this inductive reasoning training, it increased their openness. And so they were hoping that maybe that could help with their future risk of dementia. Did they find that it changed the future risk of dementia? I don't I don't think they could make that conclusion just based off of this study. Okay. Like it was like one of the first steps to see if changing personality traits could could do that. How did openness predict therapy? There's another study, Samuel, 2018. They looked at 54 therapist client dyads within a doctor training program. Yeah. So for this one, they they basically wanted to see, like, if you look at your level of openness, will it predict how you respond to therapy? They used different types of therapy depending on the patient. CBT, motivational interviewing, some third wave therapy techniques as well. And then 
they looked at the therapists rated their conscientiousness and um, how they would respond, their initial engagement to therapy. And then, so they had like therapists and clients rate themselves in different areas for the study. Mm -hmm. And then um, they found that therapists rated conscientiousness was most predictive of the initial engagement, but client related openness after the fourth session was most strongly predicted, predictive of symptom reduction over the course of therapy. Interesting. So the client rating how open they were strongly predicted their reduction of symptoms. Like, so higher openness, more reduction of symptoms. Hmm. Yeah, conscientiousness first makes the biggest impact because they're going to therapy, they're mm -hmm. following through with recommendations. But then openness, you know, like how in tune to their emotions. It's a lot of work to get someone to increase their their feelings, their ability to get connect with their emotions. That could take a lot more time, right? If someone has alexithymia, that could take yeah. a lot more time to get there. Um, and so you're able to potentially do the work earlier on if you have that, uh, that emotional awareness. In my episode with uh, Ginger on congruence, we talk about how we help people gain that emotional awareness. Hmm. There's three domains that people can be congruent in writing, in art, or in talking. And so we'll, cut, we'll have people who are not congruent in anything but art. So we have them do art. The art's very congruent. And then we have them describe the art. We have them write about the art. So then we pull the congruence into the other do two domains. Yeah, but interesting that they found that there are people who are People who tend to be low in feelings are they're sometimes harder to do work with. Mm -hmm. So I think there's ways of getting around that. And I like training people in that. Yeah. Like getting them congruent. If they're congruent in art, they may be a lot less thymia in regards to, you know, talking about or writing about their what's going on internally. But their art is not alexithymic. Yeah. So I feel like that's one of the like important things about this. Like when we're looking at therapy, if you do the personality traits. You can you can see like how do I how do I work with this patient best like especially when we're looking at openness like if they have high openness you're maybe going to try different things than if they have low openness. Yeah, and then also thinking about the domains, mm -hmm. like if if someone's high in everything but feelings, maybe they've just learned how to cut those feelings off. Mm -hmm. You know, a little bit of intellectualization, yeah. right, or uh, rationalization, especially if they're like us, like you know, professionals, that's very normal to, to have those sort of characteristics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What about this, uh, therapeutic alliance study? So they, they said we asked 38 clinicians to assess the importance of each domain in the facet of the five factor model mm -hmm. in regards to the therapeutic alliance and results indicate that high openness, high agreeableness, high conscientiousness are perceived as favorable to therapeutic alliance. Yeah. I would agree. I would agree for most, for most clinicians, you know, and, um, you know, someone who's high openness, they may not like CBT. They may like more of the psychodynamic approach, the open-ended approach. Yeah. Um, looking at their dreams, looking at their associations to like fantasies and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Interestingly, they also asked them like the facets that they thought were that would positively affect the therapeutic alliance. And um, for openness, they found that feelings, ideas, values, and fantasy mm -hmm. positively affected the therapeutic alliance. Yep, that makes sense. Okay, and then there's one other study that we looked at, Butcher 2019, looked at openness and therapy outcomes. And they found that open higher openness relates to a lot of different parts of increased ther therapy mm -hmm. outcomes. Yeah, therapy outcomes. Yeah. And neuroticism makes therapy outcomes harder. Well, because people are probably more sick and you know, neuroticism and depression are so linked. Yeah. So there you know, it's more severity and um extroversion helped outcomes a little bit. Agreeableness. And conscientiousness. So when those were high, that, that helped outcomes. Yeah. So finally, we're looking at, uh, let's see, we're looking at how openness might relate to how therapists would 
perceive them. Mm -hmm. So someone who's low openness may seem resistant to therapy and closed off. And it may be important to not mistake this aspect of the personality and judge them too early. Right. Yeah. But to rather try to work with them and to see the openness as like part of their personality and part of maybe something you can work within. So someone who's low openness might be better with more of CBT or behavioral approach early on, right? Mm -hmm. Someone high openness might be more the psychodynamic, working with the dreams, working with ideas, their feelings. Yeah. I thought this one was important because one of the things the author said was that, um, like you said, trying not to mistake low openness for like not responding to therapy. Like, especially if you as a therapist have high openness, like looking at their openness can help you realize that it, it's more a personality trait than like how invested and responsive they are to therapy. And then conversely, like if they have super high openness, you might think they're doing better than they actually are just because they might be just really good at um, thinking about their feelings and um, mm -hmm. thinking about them in more metaphorical ways. Yeah. So it just might make your, it'll make your therapy better. Like if you pay attention to their openness and how it relates to their feelings in response to therapy. Yeah. They said um, the patient's level of openness will gauge, will likely gauge how imaginative the therapist can be in regard to intervention. Patients high on this dimension can be challenged and confronted with new and unusual ways of thinking. For patients low on this dimension, novelty is frightening. For these patients, it is recommended that the clinician test the limits to see what is tolerable. Perhaps psychoeducation or behavioral therapy can be used with success. This yeah. is Anderson, 1998. So lastly, career planning. I know we've talked about this a little bit. Is there anything you would like to add? For this one, it is like a lot of what we said before. Basically, like when you're doing career planning with patients, looking at openness to figure out what kind of career path they should be choosing, like what they'll find the most fulfillment from. Yeah. I, you know, I think this is a helpful discussion. I think now let's just kind of like say what maybe our main takeaways yeah. are, if you've had any about yourself or about kind of like openness in general, about what all this means. Matt, you want to start? Sure. Um, I think taking the test was helpful for myself to better understand and sort of confirm what things are meaningful to me. I think the idea that I scored highly on the aesthetic section is really interesting for me as a pretty strong introvert. I can think back on social interactions and the times that I'm not tired and I'm getting more out of it is when we're discussing philosophical ideas, when we're thinking about bigger picture concepts. And that's something that in reflection has been really helpful for me. Um, I think that this does have a pretty significant impact on a variety of areas in your life. Um, and it's also probably affected the way that I will approach people that um, are older or younger than me, um, knowing that there are differences in openness throughout life. And I think that's probably what's going to be the most helpful for me. Yeah. Maddie? Mm -hmm. I liked the idea of looking at um, your personality traits and linking them to how you would interact with patients in therapy. Um, one of the things I thought was cool is when you take the personality test at the end, they give you like, how do you how should you take this when you relate to a patient? So for mine, um, for openness, it said, this patient is open to experience, probably including the novel experience of psychotherapy. She tends to be introspective and psychologically minded and will probably be willing to try a variety of psychotherapeutic techniques. Free association, dream interpretation, and imaging techniques are likely to be congenial. Focusing on concrete solutions to problems may be more difficult for extremely open individuals. So I like mm. that they on this test even give you some examples of how you can use this with patients um, to make your therapy more effective. So I thought it was really important, like especially in the feelings aspect of openness to realize that if patients have low openness, they just might not be as in tune with their feelings. And like, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not responding to therapy that they don't want to change. It just might be harder for them to go through the therapy process than someone with high openness. Yep. That's good. Kyle, anything? 
Yeah, I like learning about this stuff because um, it. I think it helps me have a better appreciation for people that are different from me, uh, both in like a, you know, like a clinical sense and for uh, relationships I have, you know, mm-hmm. with family and friends. Yeah. You know, I think, I think the key for me is to kind of understand how people may be different and then to think about like catering the treatment to them in the midst of their differences, you know? So if someone's super low fantasy, you know, it might not make sense to ask them about their fantasies or like, you know, about their dreams and stuff like that. Um, If someone's, you know, low in feelings to think through like, okay, is are all the other domains low or is this uniquely a a low domain? Mm -hmm. And if it's uniquely a low domain, then like maybe it's just like there's psychological defenses around it and, and it's there, you know, like, but you can't, you don't have access to it for some reason. Yeah. Right. So then it's kind of like, how do I help them be congruent into their feelings? If they're high in feelings, it might be helpful to look at, uh, you know, how do we help them cope with the strong feelings that they're having or interpret them more accurately or not jump to conclusions or mind read yeah. too extensively because, you know, often people that can then create narratives that don't really exist in other people and kind of, so looking at reality, right. And the extreme of high and openness might be like, you know, it's linked to psychosis. That was interesting to me. Yeah. Um, I also found it really interesting to think about treatment resistant depression. If they're low in openness, that might even be another sort of like hit to their, their difficulty in the treatment. Yeah. And so to think through like, you know, things like ketamine might not work as well in people that are very low openness. So, you know, just being more patient with the process with someone who's low openness as like, okay, this may be a more difficult treatment. Um, And if someone's really low openness, because I'm very high to think of like the counter transference that might develop there. And then how can, how can I think about that? Just even starting to recognize like, oh, I'm reacting to this person not because they're a different political ideology to me, but because they're probably low openness and there's that gap there in difference. So yeah, those are some of my thoughts. It was really fun to look at your scores. It kind of helps bring it more concrete to me. Yeah. And you know, if you're professional, you can actually get a license to give this test. Um, Now I don't make any money from the people who who would (laughs) do that. You can ask me by email if you want more information on that. Or if you're a professional and you're listening to this and you want to get tested yourself, you know, you could always um, engage me as your coach to walk you through what it might mean to have your score. And I would enjoy that. So I'll leave it there for today. And um, we will put this up on the website, psychiatrypodcast.com. If you want to support the podcast, please sign up for the CME. It really does help. And uh, we'll leave it there. <laughs>